Uh, Orit Rosin is a senior lecturer in the Department of Jewish History at Tel Aviv University. Uh, her research interests and publications focus on social, legal, and cultural history of the Israeli state and society in the 1950s and 1960s. Her book, The Rise of the Individual in 1950s Israel, A Challenge to Collectivism. <laughs> I've just introduced you. It's a challenge to collectivism. Ch challenge it to collectivism. <laughs> I'm very happy I wasn't here, so. <laughs> no, no, I, I've just become. You're here, you're here. Um, was published by uh, Brandeis University Press in 2011. The Hebrew version of the book published by Amovet Press yeah, in the High Weizmann Institute at Tel Aviv University received the Shapiro Best Book Award in 2009. Uh, she has published articles about Israeli legislation and ruling, relationships between policymakers and the media, relationship between immigrants and old timers, about desperate housewives in austerity time, and about the image of Mizrahi women. Uh, she published articles on various dimensions of quotidian life, such as hygiene, parenthood, and food consumption, as expressing and shaping national identity. Uh, the current lecture is part of a new book on citizenship, rights, and collective identity in Israel between 1941 and 1949 and 1961. And the title of our paper today, On the Right to be Heard, Immigrants Demanding Recognition in Israel. Uh, in July 1949, the Mapai Daily Hador published an article by Avraham Avtalion, a new immigrant from Bulgaria. The article revealed that uh, the immigrants' frustration about the rampant discrimination against newly arrived immigrants and their alienation by and from society, notwithstanding that they too fought in the War of Independence. He complained that established Israelis don't make an effort to ease the suffering endured by immigrants and added, and I quote, and now the new immigrant must struggle. For what? For a modicum of kind feelings, for some understanding of his plight, and for the prevention of discrimination and arrogance. In the study of democracy, the common practice is to discuss the voice of the citizen in the context of freedom of expression. But that is a narrow concept. It does not always include the issue of the extent to which the authorities are attentive to the voices of citizens, nor does it include all the human needs that lie at the base of their demand to be heard. The right to freedom of expression is a negative right aimed at allowing opinions to be voiced. The right to be heard is a positive right requiring policymakers to make a proactive effort to listen. The right to be heard demands that governing bodies and society see it as their duty to ensure that individuals do well and flourish in the most fundamental way in their self-perceptions. And I'll explain that. The immigrant from Bulgaria demanded not only attentiveness to grievances about the actions of the state and society, but also to the emotional needs of immigrants. Those responsible for his, his absorption were expected to display empathy and intimacy. In this, he voiced one of the important emotional aspects of the aspiration to establish a Jewish nation state. Avtalion sought more than the formal right to participate in the decision-making process. He expected to be involved in a profound, personal, and compassionate dialogue between the individual immigrant and the society taking him in. And he expected this dialogue to be egalitarian, to establish a feeling of emotional intimacy and mutual connection. The implication of Avtalion's letter was that the, that the cure for his distress and loneliness was that he be granted a sense of belonging and equality, what Axel Honneth calls recognition. The immigrant reported his negative experience of discrimination and disparagement. His response to the treatment he received was reflected in his shame and resentment. According to Honneth, each experience of social humiliation is accompanied by negative moral emotions, such as indignation, shame, and guilt. We are talking about a time when Israel's nation-building process was at its height and the plight of the immigrants acute.
the common discourse of the country's early period spoke of a shared Jewish fate. Under these circumstances, the emotional need to belong was redoubled. The new identity was meant to be based on a sense of self-respect the Jews had found hard to maintain in the face of the contempt and hostility with which they had been treated by non-Jews in the diaspora. Throughout the years of the mass influx of newcomers, established Israelis feared that the immigrants would cast a pall over the Zionist project. Both survivors of the Holocaust and refugees from the Islamic lands found that the absorbing population looked askance and down at them, and they too felt similar feelings of estrangement and disrespect. These feelings, along with the scarcity and poverty of that period, led the immigrants to struggle to receive what they saw as their fair share of the country's resources and to establish themselves as full and equal citizens. All immigrants found themselves faced with an absorbing population that was itself coping with the economic and social difficulties brought on by the war and the growing population. The challenges were enormous. As soon as the new country came into being, it was flooded with immigrants, and about half of the 700,000 newcomers were survivors of the Holocaust in Europe, while the other half came from the Islamic world. They joined the issue, the 650,000 Jews already living in the country, many of whom had themselves immigrated earlier at one time or another. In addition, the country was home to about 150,000 Palestinian Arabs. In 1949 alone, some 240,000 new immigrants arrived. In that year, in the beginning of the 1950s, Israel's economy was overtaxed and its security situation precarious. As the War of Independence dragged, and as the new country recovered, they voiced resentment of, protested and complained to, and made demands of their government and the Jewish agency, who had the power, or so the citizens believed, to solve their problems and to alleviate their emotional distress. The, fr the primary channel of expression for all sectors of society during the 1950s was the written press. Following their arrival and throughout the early 1950s, the immigrants complained about each of the innumerable defects in the absorption process. Their problems were reported on and debated in the press, both independent newspapers and those associated with political parties. One of the tactics employed by immigrants to enhance their influence and status was to establish or join organizations based on place of origin, what Yiddish speakers called Landsmannschaften. These groups provided mutual aid, served as mouthpieces for their members, and negotiated on their behalf with the authorities. Leaders of these organizations proved adept at navigating through and exploiting political rivalries to gain publicity for their ch charges um, in the party and independent press. Immigrant representatives also met with national leaders to discuss their problems. Large numbers of immigrants also joined the Histadrut, Israel's largest labor organization, which provided a range of services from medical care to housing to cultural activities. The political parties did their best to recruit immigrants and through direct assistance and by supporting their claims for better living conditions, sought to gain their votes. The question here is not the extent to which this provided effective representation for the immigrants or simply an instrumental arrangement that served both sides. My point is that even if they face a glass ceiling in some of these organizations and continued to feel discriminated against, the immigrants had available to them a variety of channels that they had exploited. And they also exploited platforms to promote, or platforms to promote their interests. Immigrants did not just rely on intermediaries to voice their grievances. They mounted direct protests. Even before the war was over, immigrants demonstrated throughout the country. Demonstrations by unemployed immigrants were common sight throughout Israel in the first half of 1949. In February, March, and April, they demonstrated in Tzfat, Ramle, Netanya, Jerusalem, Jaffa, Tiberias, Yehud, and Lod. In April, Inhabitants of Lod protested not only the lack of work, but also a shortage of electricity, bread, and flour, 
and the fact that their homes were not connected to the water supply. That same month, immigrants in Ramle went to Tel Aviv to rally in front of the building where the Knesset held its sessions and government offices. They were received at the Labour Ministry where officials promised to find jobs for the unemployed and in the meantime to waive the charges for rent. The Labour Revolutionary innovation was attached to these demonstrations by the communist newspaper Kola Am, which claimed that, as a result, sealed ears were locked uh, and locked money boxes had opened. In a telegram sent in May 1949, the mayor of Tzfat informed the prime minister that unemployed residents of his city were planning to send a protest delegation to the government offices in Tel Aviv. He asked that the government send a delegation to Tzfat. He noted that the situation there was dire and he feared horrible consequences that could also lead to bloodshed. Approximately 600 residents of Ramle returned to Tel Aviv in July for demonstrations, following violent clashes with police, which resulted in casualties, some severe among demonstrators and police alike. They held a sit-down strike opposite the government ministry office, offices. Their strike ended after Golda Meirson, then Minister of Labor, appeared among the strikers at midnight and promised hundreds of jobs for the unemployed. A similar strike among immigrants from Lod was averted after Meerson, who learned of the planned strike in time, took the preemptive step of sending clerks in order to evaluate the demonstrators' needs and to find a solution. In contrast with the common memory of the immigrants of this time, one in which established Israelis wielded unrestrained control over the newcomers, this contemporary report and others like it indicate that the former lived in great trepidation of outbreaks of immigrant rage and were concerned about the spreading protests. In the aftermath of a hunger strike at the Pardes Khana immigrant camp, a Devara correspondent spoke to the director of the camp and reported that, and I quote, while the storm has subsided for now, institutions and authorities must remove all causes of resentment that can be eliminated. The director warned that a single match can cause a horrible eruption. The immigrants also protest, protested with their feet. They barricaded themselves in immigrant absorption centers, tents and camps, refusing to be evacuated elsewhere, even when harsh sanctions were imposed. In other instances, they broke into apartments in the cities, refusing to leave at the request of the authorities. At some of the protests recounted here, and at many others, representatives of the Jewish agency, Histadrut, local governments, members of the Knesset, and government officials met with, down, with the demonstrators or the representatives in order to appease their anger, bridge differences, and find at least partial solutions to their problems. But in many other cases, the immigrants were dealt with harshly. They were forcibly evacuated and compelled to move from one location to another. The police were violent or imposed collective punishment. The government throughout the 1950s tried two tactics with the immigrants, conciliation and negotiation on the one hand and the repression of protest on the other. At the same time, the infrastructure of democracy party rivalry, a multiplicity of media outlets, the difficulties of bureaucratic coordination, and the large number of bodies with responsibility for the newcomers gave the immigrants the foundation they needed for legitimate democratic action. They played the cards that democracy dealt them. They discovered that voicing their demands loudly was a better way of getting what they wanted than politely waiting for promises to be kept. The demands like those of Abraham of Talion did not only concern living conditions and the, and the allotment of resources, they also had to do with social standing, dignity, and identity. In March 1949, Alam Ishmael published an interview with an elderly immigrant from Shanghai who said quite simply, and I quote, the official can't give me an apartment and he's not much help in finding me a livelihood, but why is he so rude? After all, a pleasant word doesn't cost money. After reporting this statement, the journalist told his, his readers, and I quote, I gazed at the old Jew and his wife, and I was ashamed for the entire yeshuv. After all, the official, that, that rude man, is one of us. We, the yeshuv, assigned him to care for the new immigrant. We placed him in the country's show window, 
but I did not empower him to be rude. Of course, it's understood that every new immigrant is going to have a tough time before he finds himself. But these adjustments, troubles, should be in the nature of heat rash, which the Israeli climate, not the Jewish agency, gives the immigrants. It comes and goes and leaves no mark. But rudeness is worse than heat rash. It's like chicken pox. Mm. Even after it goes away, it leaves marks, if not on the face, then on the immigrant's soul. The first buds signaling signs of a deeper dialogue between immigrants and the absorbing apparatus may be found in the relationship formed during the 1950s among the workers, volunteers, and various members <laughs> of organizations seeking to bridge the gap between the immigrants and the society absorbing them. Such individuals served both the, an, as agents of change and brokers between the immigrants and the authorities. They constituted, if you will, a network of listeners, composed of professionals, students, writers, teachers, artists, and even soldiers, who either worked or volunteered in the framework of various organizations, visiting and working with the immigrants. Was this network of listeners indeed attentive to the immigrants' troubles out of empathy and acceptance of them as equals? The answer to this question depends on context and circumstances. More often than not, for even the most empathetic Israelis, the culture of the immigrants was alien. That meant that they had limited understanding of and sympathy for at least some of the newcomers' problems. The act of listening had not only cultural boundaries, but also political and personal ones, which de determined how the absorbers perceived the immigrants and their needs. Nevertheless, at the very least, it is clear that beyond their patronizing attitudes, orientalist biases, and arrogance, this network of listeners and no few policymakers understood that the lives of the immigrants had to be enhanced and that their physical and social isolation needed to be ameliorated. The network of listeners identified with the difficulties faced by the immigrants and waged battles with the absorption agencies in order to promote the interests of the newcomers. To so the extent that they, that, that they could, they helped provide the immigrants with their material needs work days, warm clothing, sufficient food, education, and health services, and infrastructure like electricity and water. At times, they also provided warmth and sympathy. In exchange, they expected the immigrants to adapt to the country's culture and mores, to make themselves like the people who were helping them. The absorbers thus sought to shape the immigrants in their own image. At the same time, and despite the dominant status of the new Hebrew culture, absorbers sometimes revised their modes of action in response to the cultural needs and desires of the immigrants. The demand of the network of listeners for remedying the immigrants' material and emotional state contained within it a demand to grant the immigrants recognition. This demand grew out of a universalist perspective. The immigrants, the absorbers claimed, were human beings and Jews, just as they, the representatives of the dominant culture were. The network of listeners did not stipulate recognition of the uniqueness and richness of the cultural spectrum of the immigrants and what they represented. Yet, even in this regard, the beginning of a change were evident. This can be seen in an article bearing the title who will learn from whom, printed in a collection published in 1959. The author, Rivka Gubel, one of the senior Moshevi movement volunteers and activists, confessed to acting with European arrogance towards the immigrants and to not acknowledging the value of the diverse cultures of the newcomers from the Islamic world. She warned her colleagues against creating a hierarchy in which the new Israeli culture was privileged over those brought by the newcomers. Immigrant demonstrations, hunger strikes, and various nonverbal forms of resistance all made an impression on policymakers and volunteers and came up for discussion among those who made decisions. 
Alongside their anxiety that the regime's legitimacy might be undermined, Mapai decision makers also identified with the immigrants. In conclusion, the absorption of the immigrants into Israel's democracy was ambivalent. On the one hand, they enjoyed a broad freedom of expression and had access to the media. They were a presence in the public space, negotiations were conducted with them, and they were able to frighten the authorities who were anxious about losing control. Nevertheless, it is clear that despite their access to the public arena and their use of their political power, and despite the encouragement they received from the network of listeners, sub substantial disparities of power and status separated the immigrants from their absorbers. On the one hand, the immigrants' use of their citizens' voices brought them into the ranks of the advocates of change. In other words, their struggles can be seen as a sort of right of initiation through which they enter the ranks of Israel's citizenry. On the other hand, this achievement did not provide an adequate response to their economic and social plight. In particular, it did not relieve the emo emotional distress that became the formative influence on their self-awareness. Even if some of their material needs were provided in response to their demands, and even if they began to, began to sense that they had the power to act to change their lives, they still felt the lack of a smidgen of warmth and emotion, the absence of real understanding of how they felt, as Avraham of Talion so well put it. Thank you so much, Orit, and thank you for all three speakers for these fascinating uh, uh, papers. You exercised your right for expression. Now <laughs> the question whether you explicitly